Good afternoon, everybody. Our topic today is sparkling wine production. It's an important topic because about 5% of the wine production in the United States is sparkling wines. So it's, a, it's an important segment for our marketing plan. And uh, although sales have been recently uh, fairly flat, there's still a lot of dollar volume involved with sparkling wines. As we know, sparkling wines and champagne are the wines with bubbles. Bubbles have been known to vintners long before they could reliably be captured and preserved in a bottle. Over time, people had seen uh, this accidental re-fermentation that could take place. Uh, barrels of wine shipped to England sometimes would become spritzy in the spring after a cold winter. Also, wines that were bottled would uh, become spritzy. Typically, it was also after a cold winter that had stopped the fermentation, but there was still some residual sugar and some yeast left in the bottle. Uh, those things combined and would form CO2 and develop those bubbles. However, that was typically accidental. A certain number of things had to really fall into alignment before we could actually intentionally produce champagne. Some of the other factors that were uh, required where uh, we needed to have corks, similar to today's cork made out of oak. Prior to that, kind of wooden plugs had been used, but they really wouldn't keep the CO2 bubbles in. In fact, wooden plugs had been used all the way back to uh, when the wine was put in in 4A. But in order to hold in the pressure from the CO2, we needed uh, the upgraded ability of, of the corks to actually prevent the CO2 from getting out. We also had to have a sturdier bottle to withstand all of that pressure. Um, <clears throat> along through the 1600s, it, it became possible to produce stronger bottles because more heat could be developed uh, using coal. So a stronger, thicker bottle could be developed that uh, would withstand the pressure of that CO2. And also, during the 1670s, there was kind of a cold spell, a cold period where we had some extremely cold winters. And again, that would stop the fermentation that was taking place. And in the spring, when it warmed up again, the fermentation would continue and we would get those bubbles. But as far as intentionally producing champagne, uh, one of the key characters that we hear about is Dom Perignon. He lived from 1638 to 1715 and he was the cellar master at the Benedictine Abbey in Hautevillier. So here's a statue of him with, uh, <laughs> with his dates there. Um, <clears throat> he's known for a couple of things. He didn't actually invent champagne, but he did encourage blending juice and wines from various lots in order to get a consistent process. He also came up with the idea of securing the cork to the bottle with a string. And he's credited with the uh, famous quote that you see in your book, I'm drinking the stars. So what is champagne? A, it's marketing genius. It's become synonymous with pleasure, with luxurious living, with success, and also with love. You see the couple here celebrating perhaps at a wedding. So it's become a real standard product for us to use when we're celebrating things uh, throughout our life. In general, um, it's made to be drunk fairly quickly. We don't really linger over the aroma of the champagne. The main attraction is, is the bubbles. Uh, just to quickly go over this, the bubbles are formed uh, by a second fermentation. We're going to take wine uh, give it an initial fermentation, so it's really just a still dry wine, and then we'll have a second fermentation take place in the bottle, and that's when the CO2 bubbles form what we call the mousse, or the foam the champagne is so famous for. Uh, it's also known to be a consistent product. Blending takes place so that we can maintain a certain flavor profile from year to year. Uh, we can also blend different lots in order to uh, get a better balance for our champagne. Uh, a big benefit 
of this blending process has been to protect the price of champagne and also to protect that brand reputation. In fact, quality is very important in champagne. We, uh, <clears throat> the champagne appellation has had some of the strictest, most exacting quality standards for growing, producing, and labeling its products. So how is, uh, how is champagne made? Uh, first, we're going to use uh, grapes from the northern areas of uh, grape growing. We'll use Chardonnay, Pinot Noir, and Pinot Meunier. Uh, the grape harvest is typically early. Because we're harvesting early, we're going to keep those sugar levels low, which is ultimately going to keep the alcohol level of our still wine low. Later, during that secondary fermentation, that alcohol level is going to get boosted up. Also, with the early harvest, uh, we're going to have some youthful acids in there to preserve the wine uh, during its development. So essentially, uh, similar to other white wines, we're going to press it immediately. We want to avoid any oxidation. We want to avoid any browning that could take place if we delay the pressing. Uh, typically, for champagne or for sparkling wines, uh, we pick the grapes manually and try to handle them very gently so that uh, the fruit won't rupture. They usually be picked and put into 25-pound bins and kind of handled in those all the way to the, to the winery. At the winery, we're going to do a sorting process. Uh, I observed this at Jordan Winery in Sonoma County here. And we're looking at these whole clusters coming down the way and trying to pick out any problems with fungus or mic microbes that, that may have grown on our grapes. So we're going to exclude any infected grapes. Um, in moving it around the winery, we're going to use bins and a forklift rather than using pipes and, or screw augers and things that will really sort of tear the grapes up. So we'll handle it gently all the way through. You can see a, a bin being offloaded by a forklift here. We're going to press whole clusters, and we're going to press them as gently as possible. So this, uh, by pressing whole clusters, we're going to get a release of juice from the fleshy part of the grape first, and not so much skins and stems. Uh, doing it this way delays the extraction of skin pigments and solids. Uh, it also helps to promote early malolactic fermentation. And it favors uh, the onset of that in-bottle fermentation that will take place later. So typically the press is a, a large diameter vertical press. Uh, when we visited Jordan, they actually had a square press uh, that was also had a large area and they're able to just gently apply pressure so that the free run juice would come out cleanly without too much damage to the skins. It can take uh, about two hours to release the juice and we're going to call this juice, it's the beginning of the cuvee. About 80 percent of all the juice that we get becomes part of the cuvee. Um, after that we can uh, use more pressure, we'll have subsequent pressings to follow but their quality is going to be lower we're going to keep them separate. We may add them back in later, but we may not. Coming out of the press, uh, we're going to add some uh, SO2 in order to kill off the, uh, any wild yeast that might have been growing on the grape skins. And uh, then we're going to take this free run juice and we'll chill it in stainless steel tanks. We'll take it down to about 50 degrees Fahrenheit and uh, begin to clarify it. So we're using a nice cold temperature here in order to stop any growth of bacteria and prevent any kind of fermentation from starting before we've clarified the wine. So we're going to clarify the wine by letting it settle in large tanks for 12 to 15 hours. Uh, if necessary we can, uh, we can fine it with bentonite clay in order to remove any coloring or any pigments that we've got in the juice. 
After that, we can add the yeast of our choice. We typically use a cultured yeast. We don't want to use the wild yeast or any indigenous yeast in our champagne production. Um, if adjustments are needed, we can sweeten it by adding sugar or perhaps adding juice from a sweeter lot. And, uh, and then we'll let that initial fermentation take place. Uh, a lot of wineries, not all, also will encourage a malolactic fermentation. But what we've essentially produced at this point is a dry, still wine, just like any other white wine at this point. Um, varietal character is not encouraged in champagne. Um, <clears throat> we're actually going to ferment it at a little higher temperature, at 65 to 70 degrees. We're going to keep it fairly warm so that it'll blow off any volatile aroma components. The first fermentation takes seven to ten days, and the base wine that we've produced at this point is very acidic. So we're going to take this newly fermented wine, we'll chill it, uh, <clears throat> we'll filter it to remove the yeast, uh, we'll clarify it, and we'll cold stabilize it. So the steps up to this point are pretty similar for all of our different methods of producing champagne. But at this point, I want to focus on the method champenoise. So to review what we're going to use in the method champenoise, the traditional way of making champagne, we'll use the Chardonnay, the Pinot Noir, and the Pinot Meunier. Uh, we're going to harvest the grapes with a high total acidity. They're going to have a lot of malic acid in them. On the other hand, uh, we'll have low pH uh, and not very much sugar and not very much character. Uh, these grapes are grown in the, the northern edges of where grapes are able to grow, so they, they don't have a lot of sugar in them to begin with. And we're going to need that tartness, actually, to balance some of the sugar that, that we're going to add later. Just to give you an overview of this method, uh, what we're really going to do, we're going to take the base wine, we'll add some sweet syrup, some yeast, and some nutrients, and uh, we'll have this all in a large blending tank. Then we're going to draw it off into bottles and allow a second fermentation to take place. And then after that, we can continue, uh, continue on as the wine works its way towards the customer. So the, the wine is actually blended from many different lots, and uh, it can be from different vintages also. <clears throat> Moet et Chandon can have over 300 different base wines to work with. And so they'll do a lot of tasting uh, in order to blend it and come up with that flavor profile that they're trying to hit each year. Um, <clears throat> we're trying to keep it consistent from year to year. We we'll use wine from different lots and we can even use reserves from earlier years. So. We rarely vintage date champagne because there aren't the good years and the bad years. It's all fairly consistent and stable. So when we've got our uh, components blended together, uh, we can move on to the second fermentation, which is going to raise the alcohol level and uh, develop those bubbles and also add some of that yeastiness that will come through in the bouquet. So the second fermentation is uh, <clears throat> called the prise de mousse, catch the foam. Uh, as I said, we've added sugar and yeast in a large tank, and what we're going to do now is draw that material into bottles. That's called the tirage. You can see here's a large oak, oak tank from the old days, and they're, they're drying it off into individual bottles. And then we're going to close those bottles with an old crown seal. Uh, with a stainless steel bottle cap. <clears throat> At this point then we can let the second fermentation take place. It'll take about 30 days to complete the fermentation and after that's completed we're going to lay the bottle on its side and let it age sur lee on the lees, on the dead yeast, for a period of uh, up to two to four years. It'll stay in the bottle. When uh, we've decided it's aged long enough, um, we have to start 
working toward getting the yeast out of the bottle. So the wine matures in the bottle. It develops that nice uh, champagne, that yeasty bouquet. Now we have to collect the yeast in the neck of the bottle and find a way to get it out of there. And what they've done is a process called riddling, or remuage, collecting the yeast. So the wines will be put into a group of racks that can be uh, positioned at, at different angles and will change the angle over time and twist the bottles. That's called riddling. <clears throat> Ultimately, that will move this sediment down into the cap or down into the neck of the upside down bottle. We can do it by hand, as you see over here, which is kind of a long and tedious job over a long period of time. Or we also have some automatic riddling machines that can change those angles and help to uh, collect the yeast down in the neck of the bottle. When we've gotten it all the way down into the neck of the bottle, then we'll do what we call the disgorgement. And uh, kind of clever, the way they've come up with for doing it is to uh, freeze the yeast in the neck of the bottle, and then we can heat the contents a little bit, take that crown cap off, and the frozen yeast plug will pop out. So we'll, we'll just we'll pop it off there, and uh, you're going to lose a little bit of wine. So because we've lost some wine in removing the yeast plug from, uh, from our bottle, we're going to have to top it off. And we'll top it off with what's called the dosage. That's a mixture of sugar, wine, and uh, even some brandy sometimes. And uh, that'll also help kind of balance the tartness of our wines. But mainly, it'll fill the level of the bottle back up to an acceptable volume. After that, we can put the cork in it. You can see the unique champagne cork kind of wider at the bottom so that it can withstand all that pressure that the CO2 is giving off and, and stay in the bottle. In fact, to help make sure that happens, we've got the, also the wire cage that can be uh, put on the cork and attached to the bottle. So that's going to help us uh, from having the, uh, the corks blow out of there. At that point, we're almost ready to go, but uh, we still have to age it. We need to let it mature a little bit longer. We can let it mature for a few months, or uh, for the good stuff, we can let it mature for up to two or even three years. During this time, the, the dosage will marry with the wine, and some additional complexity will develop in the bouquet. But ultimately, it's going to be ready for the customer, and we can ship it off for everybody's uh, celebrations and weddings and uh, New Year's Eve and all of those types of events. So just to review it briefly, um, we have a step-by-step -step process that you can take a look at on the slides of the method Champagnoise. Uh, essentially, we're going to blend the cuvee. So we've got this blending process. And then we'll, we'll draw that off into bottles and let the secondary fermentation take place in the bottle and then subsequently we'll remove that yeast and we'll top off our wine. At that point it's ready to, to ship off to the customer. Now you might be thinking, uh, hey this is kind of expensive. <laughs> We're hand picking the grapes out in the vineyard. Uh, we're handling them very delicately all the way through. And it's kind of a long aging process, which means our, our money is going to be tied up for a long time also. So the method champion was uh, we've got costly grapes, uh, the expensive aging, and also some additional labor in there. So companies over time have looked for some less expensive ways to produce the champagne or produce sparkling wine. Uh, one is called the transfer process. Now, in the transfer process, everything is the same up through um, producing the cuvee, the first fermentation. Uh, it's the same as far as drying it off into bottles, but the yeast removal is different. Instead of removing, instead of storing the wine in bottles for a period of years and then removing the yeast from each bottle, we're going to empty all of the bottles into a tank and we'll remove the yeast with a settling process. So we don't have that really labor-intensive process of riddling that takes a lot of time. So that does save some money. 
we get it ready more quickly and, and we don't expend as much money on labor. The other way of doing it is a bulk process called the Charmat. And uh, typically, in this case, we're going to be using grapes from warmer areas, from, say, the Central Valley, grapes such as French Columbard. Um, we're going to use tanks instead of drawing the wine off into bottles. So we'll never do that tirage into the individual bottles. The, the second fermentation is going to take place in pressurized fermentation tanks. After that's been completed, then we'll remove the yeast, we'll remove those lees, stabilize the wine, and bottle it. And we'll come up with something that's a little more of a, a, a fruity, fresh and fruity kind of a flavor profile. So it's uh, cheaper as opposed to bottle aging, but you don't get that nice yeasty bouquet and, uh, and the sparkling wine is, is not as complex if it's used uh, produced by this bulk process. So uh, on, the last thing I'd like to do before we finish up here is uh, just kind of show you on, the, on a diagram here a couple of the main differences between those three processes. We spoke at length about the method Champenoise and the uh, <clears throat> the, uh, the transfer method instead of running the wine off into bottles, we'll run them off, run the wines off into tanks, and then clarify it by using a settling process. And then for the Charmat method, we're going to have the second fermentation take place in pressurized tanks. And then it'll pretty quickly be clarified and uh, readied for market. So several different ways of making sparkling wines. Uh, one, of the, uh, one of the better luxury brands that's been one of the first that was ever developed. So thank you very much.
set if you need to get in. Thank you. 
I don't know. I don't even know if it's the same one. But her husband's French and she's hardcore. I'm not planning on getting a name. She's hardcore. So isn't this crazy? That's what's left. I'm going to have to cross off it. They're not offering so many. These are pretty good. They're not offering them. Way too many chapters. I know. And what's the same? There's like 12. Or the other one's a prerequisite. Like you have to have language. I like these. Language ones. Oh, I think it does have to be. So I'm hoping they're doing that thing where they hold back classes and they have new sections because when you look at their wait list too, please, there's like 40 people on the wait list. Okay. Yeah, now I remember. I'm not saying this one in particular, but I've seen these other ones like 40. Yeah, I think they're higher or something. Yeah, multiply by, yeah, okay. Because if it's a quarter a day, then you would multiply by two. But then it's like all of these classes, like, are they're not even offering. And they were before. Like, I remember seeing that one before and those. Because I was looking into those signing up for those. I'm not sure what that You know what? I think I threw away I think I threw away my marketing book. What do you mean you threw it away? I was cleaning out my garage and I saw it. Yeah, I know. <laughs> it's all right that you know you sell it. I know that. 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 I know they are yeah, they are they are they are oh my god. Oh my god. You're not going to eat Isn't that ridiculous? Oh my gosh. I'm going to eat you. I was like, I like, I like, I was 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 like, I Oh my gosh, you do not oh, help people cheat, oh, by the way. Oh, 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 Stop it. Don't you have to sit It's not worth it. I think you spent $100 on a marketing book, so I just have to break my moral code. Thank you very much. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Oh, my I call it a moral code. Yeah, I knew that one. Did you get that right in this class? Can we show you how to do it? Sure. Well, yeah. Probably have a higher one. Yeah, I think you got it. Squared. Back holding clause. Yeah. Minus. Minus. No, it's so much easier than that. I'm going to get on the internet. So are you talking about the equation and then the equation? It would be like you. Q is blah, blah, blah. 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 And then I have an easy writing assignment that's due to all Wednesday, and I can turn it on over the computer. It's super easy. And this is what she asked guys out. I already told you that. She asked students out for what, what are you going to tell me? I heard she did. I heard she asked a student out. Yeah, that's what we're here saying. I heard something else about the study of concerned. Yeah, it does like study of the law. I don't even want to repeat it. That's what I'm going to do. She's not anymore. She doesn't have an active license. Well,